Good afternoon, welcome to E Thursday. Um, it is so hot in Cape Town, the wind is blowing, but it is boiling. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to sit here for. <laughs> and it's not the anointing, it's the heat. So say good afternoon when you join in. There was a time change just for this Thursday. Um, so here I am, late afternoon, Thursday, the 1st of February. Welcome to February 2024. Um, and it's going to be a good one, I can tell you that. Um, I see this, this little face number at the top there, some eyes watching. Please say hi in the comments. And I'm going to speak to you this afternoon about the keys of warfare, the kingdom keys of warfare. I've got five that I'm going to look at. Um, so please say hello, then I know who's there with me. Thank you for all the ladies who are registering or have registered for Saturday's meeting. We are 140 ladies, plus minus one or two. I'm still waiting for a few confirmations. And then I've got some ladies on a list waiting to see if they can join us. Mariette Wright, good afternoon to you. Um, yeah, so it is, you know, when God said be deliberate about creating a place for women to get together, prophetic women to connect with each other, this is what is happening. People are coming from all over. There are ladies driving down from um, Piketburg, that's up on the west coast. There's someone coming from Hermanus. There are groups of, there's a ministry team of ladies coming from somewhere in Cape Town. It is amazing. Um, oh, I should put my glasses on. No, that would help. Then I can see who's here. Mariette Wright, Kathy Purden from Port Elizabeth. Welcome to you. Forgive me for saying Port Elizabeth. I can't help myself. Amanda Eckstein, welcome to you. Viola Nirvan Hazen, I trust you better. You well, well enough to come on Saturday. Please keep in touch with me because I've got that waiting list. Um, but I hope to see you on Saturday. Wendy Lee, good to see you. Um, okay, watching from Bredarsdorp, Amanda Ekstian, welcome from Bredarsdorp, it must be hot out there. If it is so hot here in the southern suburbs, with the wind blowing, I can imagine Bredarsdorp. Bianca Mears, good to see you. Yep, I'm going to get straight into this, before I start boiling and melting here before your eyes. Um, so I'm going to get straight into it. Firstly, the... I'm so happy with this, the um, prophetic life, hearing from heaven, living your purpose on earth. As you can see, it is small, it's got 70, thin, it's got 75 pages, the writing is quite big, because I wanted it big, because it's a workbook, and um, Amanda Eckstein, you say very hot, Celeste Chambers, greetings to you, Lisa Spagnolo from Canada. Um, so this little booklet is not for sale at the moment. So I say at the moment because I want to see where it's going to go. I think it's part one of Prophetic Life Workbook. And it's only for the ladies who are doing the equipping sessions in Constantia and Somerset West. And we are going to work through it together. And I cannot wait. I will. Ladies who are here now, who are coming on Saturday, if you ordered, you part, if you're part of the equipping group, and you ordered, I will not have them on Saturday. I'm bringing them to the first session that we get together. And you will get your book. We're going to open it together. Because if I give it to you beforehand, you're going to open it and read it all. And then you're going to know what we're going to talk about. So, so the reason it's not for sale is because some of the things that we have to work through them. That's why it's called a workbook. Okay, so let's get into today. The, the kingdom keys of warfare, the posture of the kingdom, the po you know, our position in the kingdom. Lemise Bailey, good to see you. The posture in the kingdom is not fear. When I say the posture in the kingdom, our position, how we, our perception of who we are and what is going on in our lives is not fear, accusing, intimidated, undecided, confused. The posture in the kingdom is knowing who God is. Um, knowing he is for his people, he says the battle is not yours, it's mine. <laughs> We've got some things to do, 
But I think when we think about warfare, it's always this let's get together and intercede and bind and loose, and that's part of it. But now what I'm speaking to you about today is the, the keys of warfare that we have, that every single one of us can live by, can walk in, and I'm sure there are lots more. I just picked out a few that we don't realize it's all part of warfare. There's a lifestyle of warfare that we, um, there's warfare all the time, but we don't go around looking for it. And if we apply these keys that I give you today, you will, it's going to help you. Let me just say, it's going to help you. So the first, you know, the scripture, I've, one of the scriptures is Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, but against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now we know this. Um, that that we're not fighting against people, even though <laughs> it would be so much easier if we could just grab someone and pull them out of the car when they drive in front of us. But we don't because we're Christians. <laughs> um, you know, we don't argue with people in the in the face, face to face, in the face. We're not meant to argue on Facebook either, by the way. That's a big one. But we 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 live a life knowing that the warfare is not against flesh and blood. Because there's a spiritual warfare going on. So in the kingdom, God has certain ways that we can live by, certain promises. Um, and, and a lot of the, these things we don't even realize are setting us up so that when the warfare comes, we have already obtained victory. So um, I wrote, I put a teaching together many years ago and I was trying to find it about you know we taught about whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven what you loose and bind and things that god showed me bind the devil from operating in our lives without us saying a single thing and one of them is um oh, i've got to think now i wish i could find it if i'm if i give you one now I'm, i might talk nonsense so i'm going to look for it but it's simple things in our lives it's like Living a holy lifestyle. And you know, we are holy because of Jesus. We have been made holy. And it's living with a revelation that we have been set apart. And when we live with that revelation and the devil comes and tries and says or does something otherwise, we already know where we stand. And so a lot of people forget that this life we live, this victory that we live, um, is an overcoming life of freedom because Jesus paid the price. So, okay, let's get into the first key for warfare. I've called it encounter for purpose. God will never lead you somewhere. He will never tell you to do something without making his grace available to keep you in that place. But also, he will never lead you somewhere or give you something to do, or give you a promise, without revealing to you who he is. He wants you to have a revelation of who he is. So the first encounter is Moses at the burning bush. Um, in Exodus chapter 3, um, from verse 2 it says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold... The bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush does not burn. God got his attention. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. He said, do not draw the, near this place. Take your sandals off your feet and for the place where you stand is holy ground take those Woolworth sandals off your feet and buckle them and put them aside <laughs> take your Birkenstocks or your Crocs off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground moreover he said I am the God of your father the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the Jog the Jog the God of Jacob and Moses this is what the heat does to my brain the Jog of Jacob, the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, 
and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, so I have come down to deliver them. And so it goes on. Afternoon, Samantha Bert, good to see your name pop in. So here we find Moses, up until this point in time, he didn't know that God had a huge call on his life. And God knew the importance of getting his attention and revealing who he was and who Moses, Moses could lean on. And Moses could lead the people knowing that it's God, the God of, the fa of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And God had heard the cries of his people. And in this encounter, Moses would have received, first of all, he, he, if you read the rest of Exodus 3, which I'm not going to do now. But God revealed to Moses who he was, who Moses was, God was, and also why God had chosen Moses to to deliver the people of Israel from Egypt. Without that encounter at the burning bush, because you know where God said to him, take the sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. God was saying, this is a holy place. It's not like now you must come and build a building on here and put a cross here and come and be religious about it. A holy place means a place of separation from what you were before, who you were before, and now I've got your attention, and this is a God encounter, a place of encounter, where you realize that God is separating you from something to something for a purpose. And in that separation, the thing that separates you is the revelation of who God is. The other one who had this was Joshua, and it's in Joshua chapter 5, because he also came to a place where he saw the commander of the Lord's army, Jesus himself, the commander of the Lord's army in Joshua chapter 5, he also said to him, the, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. But here we find, here's another thing about a changing of a season where, jo where Moses had a revelation. Greetings, Jennifer Repanis and Brenda Libba. So good to see you. So, um, Joshua has, is, has led the people through the wilderness, but now in Joshua 5 verse 10, now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. Now they've been circumcised. They've stepped into a new place of receiving the promise of God that their promised land is yours. You're going to go and possess it now. But then it says, and they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Now, up until that day, they've been eating manna. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. This is a... a I'm leaving the wilderness and the manna behind. And now we're going to where um, the promised land is there. The, the produce of the land is there that God said we would have. But they still have to get past Jericho. So it says in verse 13, It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man, capital M, stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? I think I would have asked the same question. So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? He knew who this was. Then the commander of the Lord's army, capital C, said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Then we go to Joshua chapter 6 verse 2. Now this is why Joshua had this encounter. And the Lord said to Joshua, Joshua 6 verse 2, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. Before the walls of Jericho had come down, God gave Joshua a promise out of that place of encountering the commander of the army of the Lord, I've given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. So when God is leading us into a new season where we leave the wilderness behind, I really feel a lot of people need to stop looking back at the wilderness in the season. 
and what you know the dry times the things that happened in the wilderness and you know all of these things they need to stop looking back and look forward because God's already saying to his people I've already given you that that I've, I've taken care of the the king the mighty men of valor and I've given you that place and so if we keep looking back at um at the the wilderness we've been through at the disappointments the dry times, the times where we felt God had forgotten us, the times where we felt like Elijah sitting under the tree in the wilderness. Oh, Lord, take my life. I can't do this anymore. Jezebel is more powerful than I am. Then we miss this. We miss recognizing it's a time of encounter with God himself. Where God wants to reveal himself to you and show you that even though there's, this is a key to warfare, remember, God wants to reveal himself to you and show you who he is in the midst of your battle. And he's going to give you a promise and he's going to reveal himself to you. And he's going to say, lean on me, trust me because the battle is mine. It's not yours, but you've got to trust me. <laughs> so that's key number one, because when we have an encounter with God like that, when we have sat with him, when we've heard from him, when we have a promise from him, and, and he's revealed who he is. There's faith that comes. And we're not looking back anymore. Now we know we can be like Je Joshua. And we can look at the walls of, of the obstacles in front of us. And we know that God said, I've already given the king. I've given Jericho, its king, and the mighty men into your hand. I've revealed who I am. A revelation of who God is, is enough for us to look at a battle and say, I know I can overcome in this thing because God's with me in the thing. He's already gone before me. So when there's an encounter like that, God is revealing his power and he's also revealing his character. So that to me is a huge key. When God reveals who he is and how he is and he gives us a promise and he says, keep looking forward. We can do this together because that's what it's all about. Okay, I see somebody popped in here, Leona Moss. So good to see you from Perth. Maybe this is a better time. I see get the Perths and the Canadians. Anyway, okay, so here's key number two, and it's called authority to govern. Some believers, not you, the people who are not listening, have forgotten that they have authority because in a battle, they just sit back, play dead, and wait for the storm to pass. Today, that's not good enough in the days we live in. We have to remember we have authority in, it's 10.17 p.m. You are late nighter. Okay, so it's not such a good time. I notice there are no other Australians here, I think. I don't think I've seen. So, um, so thank you for staying up so late to hear my South African accent. So a lot of people, you know, they think that... You know, I'm going through a hard time and they don't do anything about it. Now, I'm going to read a scripture. You, we are meant to, you know, when Jesus said to his disciples, in my name, you will cast out demons. You will lay hands on the sick. You'll do all these things in my name. Whatever you ask the father in my name, he will do for you. When he said in my name, he was saying, you have authority in my name. <laughs> you have the backing of heaven. You have, I've signed on the dotted line. Be, for you to receive your inheritance because I paid for it. And so when the devil comes along and tries to make us think that God's forgotten about us, then it, and we feel that way, then it means we've forgotten that we have authority that Jesus himself gave us and paid for. So we have authority to govern and we also have authority to resist. Now here's a scripture, Romans 8, 15 to 17, and I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. The devil wants you in the middle of a battle, in the middle of something that you have, seem as if you have no answers for, and it's just wrestling and strife and feeling terrible. The devil wants to make you feel like a fearful slave. And here's the scripture saying you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit. If we remember we have the Holy Spirit... We won't be so fearful in a battle. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. 
for his spirit joins with our spirit too. We affirm that we are God's children. In other words, we have an inner witness by the spirit that we belong to God. We are children of the king who have a right to be in the kingdom. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. The devil and darkness cannot cohabit with the glory of God. But if we don't walk in the revelation that we've been given authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and we don't operate in the authority, then darkness just comes and overwhelms us. And it says, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Isn't that fantastic? Oh, bring it on. But that suffering is the suffering, not the suffering, the price that Jesus paid for at the cross. We are meant to... We are not meant to pay a price and have our bodies broken and, you know, what Jesus did. So that we are meant to live on the other side of the price that he paid, and that is the victory. You've heard me speak about this before. The healing, the wholeness, the restoration, the clarity of mind, receiving revelation. We're not meant to expect um, the terrible things that Jesus went through. But he went through it so we wouldn't have to. He became a curse so we wouldn't we would be free. And so the suffering is this, we're speaking in Romans chapter 8, we must, if we're going to share his glory, then we must also share his suffering. The suffering was the opposition against the plan of God. Jesus was opposed by the religious. It's the accusation. The suffering is the limitation when God has said increase. The suffering is fear, anxiety, discouragement, depression. But we have been given authority in Christ to deal with those things. So that's a huge key for me. That's a huge key to warfare. But a lot of people don't understand it. So they put up with the sickness, lack, everything Jesus paid for, they put up with it instead of saying, uh-uh, I'm a co-heir with Christ. What does it look like to be a co-heir? Just think of this. The, the royal family in England, whether you're a fan or not, I'm going to use them as an example. Here we have King Charles with the clothes he wears, the car he gets driven around in, the places he lives in, the influence he has, the favor he has because of his title. Now, can you imagine if his children um, couldn't wear the same clothes? They always had to wear, you know, like, let's go to Ackerman's or Pep stores. If you buy there, I'm not judging you. I'm just using this as an example. You know, they have the same favor, the same influence, the same, um, you know, what we see on the outside. They're well put together. <laughs> they know how to behave. If we are co is with Jesus, we are meant to look like him. And how would it be if we walked around in sackcloth, moaning about our problems all the time, and then on the one hand we say, our oh, God is so great. You know, God wants people out there to look at you and see his glory. What does it say? Um, if, in fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory, glory, the character, the blessing, the presence of God in our lives does something. It shifts something. Okay, so that's it, authority. Remember, you have authority. Don't roll over and play dead when the devil comes knocking at your door. You get up and you say, you have no place here. Healing is mine. I have an inheritance. I'm a co-heir with Christ. You know, I'm a mighty woman of valor. I'm not putting up with your rubbish devil. Operate in the authority. It's a key. We know about it. We read about it. We hear about it. But we don't operate in it. Authority in Christ is powerful. It's not your own authority. It's not how loudly you pray or, you know, all the things you can do. It's knowing he paid the price and he, it's in him that I have authority. Okay, so next one, I call it rest and not works. Rest. If we are performing, if we, because sometimes the pressure to perform, I call it performance Christianity. The pressure to perform makes us 
so busy, and when I say perform, doing a lot of stuff. That's the only way I can say it. <laughs> got to pray more. Got to fast. I've got to fast, you know, 50 days. Never mind 40 days. I've got to do this. I've got to give this. I've got to be here. I've got to say this. I've got to behave this way. Performance Christianity, which is not relationship. It's religion. That's performance Christianity. And a lot of charismatic Christians or spirit-filled Christians live out of performance as well because they think they've got to perform. They've got to work hard. And so the pressure to perform gets us so busy that sometimes we worked our way out of the will of God. And we're doing what seems right, but it's not his perfect will for our lives. And that invites the battle. Performance Christianity, because then you will never measure up and you'll always be saying, but I should be doing more. When God is saying, come on, enter into rest, surrender, rest in me and let me lead you. Because if we're so busy performing and doing works out of fear, then we can't hear God. <laughs> I found when I'm anxious, I can't hear God. And when I'm anxious, I need to hear God. When I'm discouraged, I need to hear God. But if I get into performance mode, instead of coming to him, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what we need. So rest is powerful. Rest is a key. A key, a kingdom key to warfare. A huge one is rest. What did I say the first one was? Encounter, so God can reveal himself to you. The second one was um, authority, operating your authority in Christ. And the next one is rest. And listen to this in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's the story when the, the man at the gate beautiful was healed and, and the religious people had a problem and um, they wanted to put Peter and John in jail and they started, Peter started to preach and they saw the boldness of Peter and John. I don't know what, what they perceived, what, they, what made them realize that they were uneducated and untrained, um, but they marveled and they, they knew the only way these guys can be so bold in the face of intimidation and religious people threatening them, they realize these guys are so bold because they've been with Jesus. That's what happens with your life. When you get out of the performance thing, I've got to do so much instead of I've got to be with him more. Then there's a boldness that comes on you. And in a time of warfare, your power is resting in him, not in how much you can do. You know, your sword and your Bible and hallelujah and I raise a hallelujah. It's those things come out of being in him. In him we have an inheritance. In him we have redemption. And and the key to, to overcoming in warfare is rest in him. And then there's a boldness that come on you. Yep, our works are never good enough. And still somehow we try and do so much. Okay, so let me give you these thoughts. God doesn't withhold from us because we haven't performed. Because there's a scripture, I think it's in Romans. He freely gives us all things. This is his character. He freely wants to give you all things. Whether you don't have to perform for him, to get him to bless you, do things for you. You don't have to perform for God to speak to you. Do you know that? Because he knows that faith comes by hearing. And he wants to speak to you because he knows you need to have faith. So people think, unless I perform, God's not going to speak to me. <laughs> okay. Then also, he knows you need wisdom. So James says, especially in a battle, when you need to make decisions, you need to know what to do. You need wisdom. James 1 verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally, generously, extravagantly, without reproach, which means without fault finding. And it will be given to him. All we need to do is go to God, ask him. For if you feel that you are entering into striving or performing because you think God has forgotten about you and, you know, it's like having a house full of children and they're all making a noise and then the one starts making a louder noise or doing something 
that is naughty to get attention and then all eyes are on that child. I think sometimes that's how we behave in the kingdom. Let's do something to get God's attention and it's not something naughty. It's something, you know, we want to be better people. We can't be better people without his help. So be set free in that area. He wants to give you wisdom. He wants to freely give you all things. Okay. Here's another key. I've got this is I've got two more keys. And so far I haven't melted just a little bit, but we're getting there. This key is, is also important. I call it simple obedience. Simple obedience. Many times things we are instructed to do don't make sense. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, when it talks about the, war, the, the, um, the weapons of our warfare, it says, having done all to stand, stand. In other words, we do our bit. We put on the weapons of our warfare, the shield of righteousness, what? the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. We've got all of these things. We're clothed in what, how, whatever God has said to us in his promises. And then it looks like the battle is still raging and the instruction is, Still stand. Keep standing. If you are here today and you feel like all you've done is stand and the battle keeps raging on, pat yourself on the back because you're still standing. <laughs> you are still standing. I'm still standing. What's that song? I will not sing it to you, but there is a song. So Rory, Rory and I, I, I remember this when I was putting these thoughts together that um, we believe that God was going to provide for us, and he has. Up until this day and beyond, we know he is our provider. But in the early days when we were driving around ministry in our car, we needed a new car. And we were going on a trip for a weekend with our two kids to, to preach somewhere in Caledon. Now, for you outside of Cape Town, um, it's about two hours from where we live. We had to get into our little car. I think we were driving a Mini back then. I, I'm, I'm sure we were. We were driving a Mini. It was in the very early days of ministry. We had a little yellow Mini, and, and people used to joke about it. It's like a little yellow block of margarine or butter because it was a nice little bright yellow Mini. And um, we, we received a prophetic word from someone about that car, that God would keep that car going until he provided another one. And he did that. There were times we would drive in that little car with hardly any petrol. It was like the smell, you know, a naughty car. It was like the smell of an oil rag with keeping that car going. And then um, at the last minute, like the last drop, somebody would give, put cash in one of our hands. We could put petrol in our car. Um, but here we were driving to, we went to Caledon and we did a meeting and um, I remember, I, I can't fully remember, but there was a man in the meeting who was a doctor. We didn't know he was a doctor at the time, but I remember him coming to, I think he came to me, or, or, or we were invited to someone's house for lunch. I could have, if Rory was here, he'd be saying, no, it wasn't that. But this is my what I remember. It was so long ago. It was like 30 something years ago. And so we were having a meal with people. We we never spoke about, oh, we'd love a new car. We never said anything at all about money. We don't go around and advertise how we live. And so um, so this man, um, we had to go past his house for some reason. And he put an envelope in Rory's hand. And Rory put it in his jacket pocket, his shirt pocket. And he said, uh, God just told me to bless you. So we got into the car. I remember the two kids in the back, Rory, myself, little Mini. We did love that Mini. We've got so many good memories of driving around in that Mini. Um, and Rory said, open that envelope and see what's in there. And so I opened it up. There was a check for 10,000 Rand. Now, can you imagine 30 something years ago, how much 10,000 Rand was? And there was a little note written on the doctor's prescription. This is towards your new car. I'm telling you, those testimonies, Leona, you say you love them. 
those testimonies of how God miraculously provided out of nowhere. But you know what? why I believe those things happened? Because we were so fully persuaded that when God said, I'm going to be your provider, I'm going to show you miracles, I'm going to show you what I can do, we believed it. We lived with this expectation that God was going to do something for us and in our lives. When we bought this house that we've been living in since 2001, it's a whole testimony on its own for people who are needing breakthrough and you trust in God to own your own home. We didn't have the paperwork to prove that we could pay a bond. Um, we didn't earn a salary and somehow we got a bond. And, um, and it was a huge step for us to pay a bond. I mean, what we pay now is ridiculous compared to what other people pay. And we have one year left and our house will be paid. By this time next year, our house will be paid off. And so, um, so we, you know, when we bought this house, there, there were transfer fees that had to be paid. And it was, I think it was 18,000 Rand. I'm not sure. It was in 2001. And we were out, we were ministering somewhere in the country and a friend of ours took us out for a meal and on the way home to where we were staying, he just said, listen guys, uh, my wife and I heard from God, we need to pay your transfer fees. And, you know, we've seen God. If you're trusting God for provision, I'm telling you, the simple obedience is God speak to me and then believe that promise <laughs> and don't back off. So it might take a long time. But the simple obedience to do the things that God gives us to do is the key in warfare. Because the devil's trying to get you distracted, trying to get you discouraged. And then we don't believe anymore because we're so busy trying to fight a battle that God has already given us a promise to overcome in. <laughs> so, okay, now here's my last one. Speak the promise, not the problem. Big key in warfare. Speak the promise, not the problem. Um... This is how I see it. God gives us a promise because it's a weapon. <laughs> but recently I've begun to look at it like this, that the, the word of God is like a double-edged sword. So when God speaks to us, they are, it's got two edges. <laughs> so the first word, the word comes first. The word doesn't change, but the promise comes. And that promise first comes to comfort you. It comes so that you realize, wow, God knows. God's here. He hasn't forgotten me. He gives you a promise. But the word is not meant to just keep you in a place where, oh, you know, shame, I feel sorry for you. I understand this. I, you know, it, it, God loves me and that's okay. It is okay, but God intends you to move, to keep moving. And so we get this word and we're so comforted and we write it down and we go back to God and we say, oh, thank you, God, that you reminded me how much. And then, you know, how much you love me and what you're going to do for me. There has to come a point where we turn that word over and we get the other side of the sword where it becomes a weapon. <laughs> where it becomes something that increases our expectation. That God didn't just speak to comfort me. He spoke to activate me, to, to give me expectation, to raise my faith level so that I can believe that he's still going to do what he said he was going to do. But if we don't speak the promise and we're too busy speaking the problem, we're not using that word as a weapon. And it's powerful. That is, I think that is our biggest key in warfare, is speaking the promise and not the problem. It's easy to speak the problem. So when we look at the giants, they're gonna, there's going to be opposition. The giants are just a face of intimidation looking at you and saying, no, God didn't mean that, God can't do that. Are we going to look at the giants and speak the problem like the Israelites did? Or are we going to say, no, we're going to eat them like bread. I've got a double-edged sword in my hand. I'm comforted. I feel good because God's with me. But I'm going to rise up and be who he said I am. Remember the first one. I'll give you the things. But firstly, let me give you this. I spoke about gumption a while ago. The, the, the synonyms or the meanings of gumption. Spirited, initiative, courage and guts and it also means the ability to make intelligent decisions the the opposite of gumption is short-sightedness and so if we look at the problem all the time we become short-sighted it's like we we've got to go all the way up to the problem and we investigate it and we wrestle with it 
instead of looking further than the problem and seeing God gave me a promise. That's a sword, a double-edged sword. So um, I'm going to give them to you very quickly. Again, the keys to warfare. And I trust that you were encouraged by this. The first one is encounter. God wants you to have an encounter with him. And I'm not saying you've got to fall on the floor and have goosebumps and have this, you know, I had an encounter with the Lord. God just wants to reveal who he is to you. <laughs> the next one is authority. Authority to resist and authority to govern in Christ. It's not your own authority. The next one was rest. No performance Christianity. Operating out of rest. That makes you bold. The, the next one was simple obedience. And speak the promise, not the problem. Now that's me done for today. How's that? 40 minutes. And the only reason it's only 40 minutes is because it's so hot. Now what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to say goodbye to you. I will go say hello and goodbye. I'm going to put my laptop, close my laptop. I'm going to put my swimming things on and I'm driving up to my mother's house. Most of you know it's her birthday. That's why today was changed from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I'm going to jump in her pool. It is so hot. So thank you so much for being here today. Kathy Purden, Leona Moss. Uh, Leona, I'm sure you are loving living in Perth. But then again, it gets very hot in Perth. I don't know how you're doing it. Celeste Chambers, nice to see you. I'm going to see you on Saturday. Natasha Hose is going to connect later. Wendy, I'll see you soon. Maria, right, Megan Harvey, nice to see you. I can't wait to see you on Saturday. Um, Leonie Sayers, Natasha Hose, okay. And there are a whole lot of names I will not go through, but thank you so much for joining me today. I meant to give you a bit of a report back about my trip to Pretoria. All I can say is it was really good. It was Friday night with elders and a worship team. Saturday was a prophetic, a ladies, not prophetic, a ladies ministry time, ladies conference. And it was absolutely wonderful. God showed up and ministered to his people. And I loved every minute of it. I flew up to Pretoria with one of the ladies on our ministry team, Team Sue. And we ministered so well together. Sue just jumped in there with me and, and helped me minister to people. So, thank you so much for joining me today. I will see you tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. There's a bite-sized word going up. And then Saturday, yeah, I can't wait for Saturday. If you're not in Cape Town, if you haven't registered for Saturday, pray for us. I'm trusting God that people will be filled up. God said to me yesterday or the day before, gather empty jars and I will fill them with fresh oil not that you're an empty jar but you know a lot of people need something fresh a touch from God and that's what we trust in God for for Saturday so have a fantastic Thursday afternoon and I'll see you all soon again bye